Right. Thank you so much. Now, I would like to call upon Yang Prabahaya Professor Dato Hamdi, Vice Chancellor of University of Malaya, to deliver his presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hand together for Professor Dato Hamdi. Thank you so much for the uh, yeah. Thanks for the uh, chance for me to stand in front of you. It's a great honor, though. I have uh, 20 minutes. Probably I'll try to finish it off in uh, 15, if possible. Um, and then we have a question and answer. Do I have the uh, slides uh, controlled or no? Oh, you're going to control. Okay. Anyway, um, shall we move on? I think Prof Chen has already uh, shared with us a lot, and I'm very happy to hear the points that he has already shared with us. I'm trying to contextualize it in Malaysian scenario as much as possible so that you know we can actually see from our angle more um, relevant to what we are facing at the moment. So there are a couple of new realities. Probably it's also applicable to uh, some other countries as well. But as I mentioned, I'm talking within the context of uh, Malaysian education. All right, shall we? OK, these are some of the uh, challenges that I think uh, we are all aware of. Uh, I'll probably start off with the last one, changing funding support for higher education. In terms of the public university, we are really facing and feeling the heat where the government is slowly cutting and, and now um, accelerating the cutting process. And uh, for research universities, five research universities, we are only given the emolument. And we have to actually find the rest of the funding in order to stay afloat. So this is quite challenging, though, because simply because people like me, a professor in the university, we have been trained to spend, not to generate. And suddenly, being in the chair of a vice chancellor, we have to generate. So that is a total mindset change. And, and we are not, not a businessman. And how much do I have to raise? Well, I have to raise a minimum of 200 million supposed to be 400 million. If I can raise 400 million, I won't be a VC, right? <laughs> I would have, you know? Yeah, the fact that I can't raise 400 million, I'm a vice chancellor. <laughs> so that's a real challenge that we are facing. And then modern university as a corporate entity. We are now slowly moving to be a corporate entity rather than a higher institution as what we know before. So slowly moving into that direction, thinking like a corporate leader, rather than a vice chancellor, an academic leader. You start to have the business acumen install as if, you know, we have to download all this knowledge uh, qu quite instantly. And uh, there are lots of competition between the uh, education provider. And we are actually looking at the same market, ma same market segment, and the competition is gonna be more in the future. So it's very hyper sort of uh, uh, competition. Hence, we need to open up the market more attracting international students, start collaborating. Otherwise, we keep on looking at the same market segment and it might not be, uh, might not be sustainable, in fact, in the future. The technology and digitalization has taken us uh, in storm, really. We have never thought that we can teach without students in front of us, and we have done that for the past two years uh, in that lightning speed. You know, a lot of our lecturers, you know, professors who are seniors have difficulty initially, but they realize very quickly that they have no choice but to move into the digital spheres and they move in very, very fast. And now they realize that, wow, you know, I can do that without having to be personally present in the class and the students can be everywhere. That has changed the landscape a lot and the changing aims, relevance of social inclusion. Previously, we have never heard of, uh, you know, inclusivity, you know, we, we, we don't really mind about that. Now we are talking a lot about that, the gender disparity, you know, the inclusivity, and the university are now kind of having to take that into account, uh, which we probably have not done so uh, many years ago. So we are more conscious now of the need of the uh, OKUs, for example, and that's quite a taxing and, and challenging um, tasks to actually provide for all segments of, uh, of society to be inclusive. Again, higher education as economic force and income. This is very, very crucial. 
our country, for example, has been relying a lot on foreign investment. And when we say foreign investment, we are looking at primarily the, uh, the manufacturing sector, which previously has contributed roughly around 40% of the GDP, now has shrunk to roughly around 21%, 22% fluctuating around that number. In, in some cases, around 19 point something percent. So around 20% uh, is manufacturing. And when we say manufacturing, we are looking at mainly assembly. Yeah? The uh, foreign investors coming in because of tax incentive, because of the uh, good infrastructure, because of stability perhaps previously, because of the, um, the workforce, young and vibrant workforce, because of the capacity that we have, because of a lot of uh, tax exemption uh, incentives that government gives. But now, a lot of other ASEAN in countries have already done the same, in fact, more than that. So they can quickly switch off and switch on somewhere else, bring the entire lot of overseas, for example. And we are actually left uh, in a lurch and not knowing what to do. The entire company, for example, if, if they switch off the investment, the, say, for example, 1,000 engineers, they can't assemble and say, okay, we're going to do the same product. They can't do that because the design, the brain part is actually done in the parent company, in the mother company. We are just doing assembly. We have been doing assembly for so long. And this has created a lot of uh, issues in the country because we are trapped in the so-called middle, middle income uh, trap and we can't escape from that. And how do we actually overcome this? Actually, through higher education, where we push in innovation and entrepreneurship. That's the way forward. I think Singapore has been doing that for quite a number of years already. They have been championing it, knowing that the financial hub that they have been championing, fighting and, and competing uh, with Hong Kong, for example, for quite some time, is not going to last long because the market segment has probably you know, reached the level of saturation. So what do they do? Move on to entrepreneurship, innovation entrepreneurship. Uh, last couple of days, they have reported, the you know, NUS particularly has reported the eighth uh, uh, unicorn from their student. Unicorn, by definition, is any, any startup that has reached the $1 billion revenue, not ringgit, dollar. So they have, at the moment, eight unicorn. The question is how many that Malaysian universities have produced? How many unicorns have we produced? That's a good question mark, actually. So the next economic force should come from the university. So it's not just education but it's actually building capacity and building the GDP in the future. So I think that's where we are going, supposedly. Yeah, so post-pandemic uh, uh, is opened up a lot of possibilities and uh, we are all excited, uh, feel challenged at the same time. I think this is, you know, you know, this is all finding, you know, fine-tuning what they are doing and trying to see what, what, what best uh, that we can do in order to prepare ourselves. So, uh, for universities to be future ready. Okay. And very quick uh, notes on, on some of the pertinent issues. Number one, the cost of learning can be driven down to zero. People sit at home, they can get uh, education everywhere, and some are free. Some countries are still free. I think we are aware of that. Germany is almost free. France is almost free. They are now rethinking about that. International students may be uh, uh, may be charged, but as of now, it is still almost free. So we can actually enroll and then take courses over there with, with almost, you know, uh, no cost, almost no cost. Secondly, we are made accountable for our results. Previously, we are just churning our students and graduates, and now we have been asked, how much is your graduates getting per month? If they are getting less than 2,000, we are, we are to be blamed. Why your student get 2,000 ringgit per month? 1,500 ringgit per month. You are supposed to generate graduates that get at least 3,000, at least. Now, there's a lot of uh, pressure on the university because the results are made accountable to the university. How many percent are getting employed, right? It has become a marketing tool now. Oh, I have 100% employability. The question is not just 100%. The question is, who are they working for? And who are they working with, for example? What position are they getting? How much money are they getting per month, for example? 
Those are all non-existent in the discussion. The one that has been put forward is how many percent get jobs. So this is very much now an issue in the education sector. Number three, learning journey are entirely flexible and customizable. UM, for example, has been engaging with others uh, in that format as well, trying to make it flexible. So we have now 23 programs out of 77 undergraduate programs that can actually have double major or the major minor. So 23 to the power of two. So we are talking about more than 500 courses now, which can actually have double major and double minor, similar to the rest of the universities you know, that we have heard just now. Commercialized research pay for itself? Yes, we need to move into that direction. Uh, we have had lots of research being done. We produce in a similar year roughly, for example, 3,000 papers. The rest of the RUs are almost there now. Uh, UKM is nearing 2,900 papers. WOS I'm talking about, Scopus more. So we are now gearing towards that. But what exactly is the impact of all these papers? Now people start questioning. We have 600 uh, patterns lying on the shelf now, for example, in UM. Likewise, in all RUs, primarily, it's the same and similar condition. Are we actually generating commercialized output rather than just having pattern, having lots of output from the university? But the impact is still questionable. So we are looking into that. Again, that's an another show. Technology could solve global supply demand mismatch. Yes, very true now. We can access to anywhere without having to be you know, moving around at all and, and this has really kind of disrupted a lot of our, our but at the same time giving us the opportunity to expose our students so last time mobility we have to ensure that the students will go somewhere right and bringing them into the campus but now the situation has changed we can do virtual mobility even though it's not similar but still the mobility program can be done so technology has really uh disrupted a lot so despite changes eh, there are successful uh, features. Let, let's see some of them. Number one, these are old stories, but still we are grappling with it at the university level in, I think, in our Malaysian context. Previously, lots of universities in Malaysia, when we recruit people, we just recruit people with PhD to ensure that we have enough manpower to teach. Now, we have shifted the, man, the, the whole idea. It's not just PhD. In, uh, Malaysia produced a minimum of 8,000 PhDs per annum. Imagine the whole university in Malaysia, 8,000 PhD holders. So we are not short of talent. But now the issue is, are we getting in or bringing in the talent that will become giant within wait, like 10 years? So that is the biggest question mark. Now. So talent, academic, academician and researchers are, are really the main focus now. No Tom, Dick and Harry can enter the university as, as our staff unless the person has potential to become giant within 10 years. Number two, they have sizable budget, both for operations and cutting edge research. Looking at the top 100 universities in the world, for example, assuming it's in QS ranking, you will notice that every one of them will have a sizable budget of beyond a billion ringgit. You will notice that. Let's take an example. Our 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 neighbor, NUS, for example, have more than seven hundred million Sing dollar per annum for the research for the past couple of years. NTU has got last year six hundred and eighty million Sing dollar times three point one, three point two. That's already two billion. And uh, Korea University, for example, rank number seventy. 78, if I'm mistaken, in QS World Ranking, has got close to 2 billion ringgit. Of course, we convert to Malaysian ringgit. 2 billion research fund. And you know how much Uzi Malaya is having for its research fund last year? Take a guess. 100 million, are you? I'll be in the top 10, you know, by no time. <laughs> Uzi Malaya, surprisingly, only has 60 million last year. So my colleague, I was from, uh, you know, I just got back from Singapore uh, attending APU, Asia Pacific Rim University, uh, you know, com uh, presidential meeting. We have 60 of us, uh, UCLA, Berkeley, you know, Tsinghua, University, Peking. These are all the members. And you see, Malaya is only one from Malaysia. It was uh, 
they were asking me how much. I said only 60, uh, 60 million ringgit. How did you do that? How can you maintain 60? I said, I have no idea, honestly. And then they said, can I come to Zimla here to see how you do it? I said, come, you won't learn anything. So, you know, the budget is so meager that, you know, it's so small. We are very worried about this because it's going to have an impact on us in the near future. And then they thrive in an environment that fosters academic freedom, autonomy, which is very, very important. We, we give autonomy to the, to the lecturers, to the students, you know, and this is uh, eroding fast if we are not controlling this very well. So the law and regulation, the AUKU and so on, must provide for this. Otherwise, we will stifle the, uh, the, the enhancement and the improvement of the university. Number four, they are led by visionary and strategic leadership. This is very, very important. We cannot compromise at every level, uh, the vice chancellor, the deputy, the dean, the department. We need to have great leader. Good is not enough. The issue is we do not need good. We need great leaders to actually lead the universities at every level. There's no one can warm the seat anymore. Everyone else must be visionary, must be strategic in the move. I think that's the only way forward with the little money that we have, with the challenges that we are facing. And you see, it's actually faced with these challenges. You know? And, in, and um, in the private uh, setting, it may be different. But in public universities, the law has stipulated that, you know, there are circumstances where the selection of the vice chancellor, the deputy vice chancellor are all determined by the minister. So this is a different ballgame altogether. And the ministry must understand that they have, I believe they understand this very well. They must pick up those with vision and strategic mind to actually lead the university. And it takes two to three years only. One term is enough for a wrong vice chancellor to sit there. It will damage the entire university in a split second. It is so damaging that if we are not careful with this, we will see the impact. And reviving it, building it up, takes more than 10 years. So this is a very crucial component. And we have seen at least the four uh, items as the main uh, component for successful universities uh, in the world. I do not have that much time. I think I've already run down uh, 40, 15 minutes. Maybe the last one. Uh, yeah, we must embrace transformation. Maybe the third. So another one, please. Yeah, in Nisim Layer, again, a very short one. Nisim Layer, in order to prepare ourselves for the future, we set a new compelling vision. What is that vision, you see? That vision is to be a global university impacting the world. This is this is very crucial for New Zealand. We have this vision last year, but we crafted it after several engagement with stakeholders and whatnot. We said, this is what we are going to do for the next university of the future. Global university, truly in its name, and not only that, impacting the world. In order to do that, we have to impact the nation. So everything else being done in the university is geared towards this vision. Make people understand that this is where we are going. If we do something, we must make sure what impact are we doing. It's not just number of papers now. It's not the number of PhDs that we, we churn out every year. It's the impact that they have created. It's not just numbers. Number is important, very important, because of the critical mass. We need to have the critical mass. But more importantly now is what is the impact. So I think we are all sharing the same thing. And the mission that we have... Uh, created is pushing the boundary of knowledge and aspiring new leaders, nurturing aspiring leaders. So similar to what other universities are facing. So this is again a preparation for university to become the future university or the university, the, the university for the future. I know that we have a lot more to share, but because of the interest of time, I may not have the luxury to go through each one of them, uh, which I thought is quite interesting and, and uh, need to be shared with the rest because it's not owned by one university. But as the uh, leading university, Muslim Laya has to set the tone right and has to set example because this is the way forward for the country. It is not meant for one university. It is meant for the entire higher education in the country to go. So I think this is the uh, position that we are taking, looking beyond our shore and wanting to hopefully create the impact. We need to do something. 
uh, it is a very clear example. I just to give you a last example before I, I, I end this my session. We have a flood a couple of months ago, right? A huge flood in Selangor. I'm not quite sure whether your university is affected or not. But we lost what five to six billion ringgit because of this flood that stays for at least two weeks. The question is, which university that actually sprung up and say, okay, let's you know build capacity, bring up, bring bring in all the experts, the subject matter experts in flood, flood mitigation, design of uh, uh, you know road planner, for example, town planning, our civil engineers, our QS guys, our architects and propose to solve the problem of Salano, for example. Losing 5 billion is no joke, man. It's a huge issue. Even when you know, we lost 48 people, 48 lives has been lost in the flood. We should not be, should happen at all in the first place. So what is the function of university then? We just send our students to clean up houses, right? Is that what we do? Is that all that we do? Where goes all the brains and the you know the experts in in so many fields? Do we actually come up with a consortium and say, okay, this is how we solve the problem, so that it won't happen again? Even though it says that it happened one in hundred years, but it may happen again and again because of the because of the climate change, right? It may happen within the next ten years. So we have lost another what five billion, six billion, another fifty lives lost. Are we going to be facing that challenges again? So this is the thing that I think university has to start thinking along that line, not just educating graduates and students, but think of what is the impact to, the, to those, you know, uh, to, the, to the country, to the region and to the world eventually. So I think this is, again, the thing that which is now uh, becoming a huge debate in the university, Simulaya particularly, uh, bringing up this issue and people uh, start aggravating, you know, they start to aggregate and, and start thinking together. We have some funds. If you need the fund, we will only disperse the fund if you manage to prove that there's an impact and you are doing this uh, in a multidisciplinary manner. No one can actually solve this problem. For example, the flood. It requires a lot more than just one faculty or even one department for that sake. So this is, again, the way forward, in my opinion. The university playing a role in producing impact either lo locally or regionally, what more if it's international? And I think this is all the challenge for all of us on how we can deliver this effectively. So again, thank you so much for inviting me. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much.